Greetings, fellow mortals, me, my small army of plants, and these bangs that I cut with a pair of scissors from Ikea I bought two years ago, would like to welcome you to a video about two of my favorite things, Product Vision and Nintendo. <music> About a year ago that admittedly feels more like a lifetime because what is happening to the world oh my god i wrote an article called mvp like nintendo in 1980 which talks about the game and watch as the minimum viable product for nintendo's handheld gaming legacy from this branch to talk i did at the game developers conference called don't ship product ship value start your minimum viable product with a solution it's a mouthful i know but like i couldn't come up with a shorter title so but i didn't focus on nintendo because i don't work at nintendo so that'd be just kind of weird but instead that talks about when you're thinking about the MVP of your product, what are some things to keep in mind? Then earlier this month, I posted a poll on Twitter asking if um, anyone would be interested in listening to me talk about stuff again, because the camera and mic I bought from Best Buy, I was originally planning on returning after recording my GDC talk. Uh, I am now stuck with because quarantine happened and then I couldn't leave the house for, well, I still can't leave the house. Actually, that's why I'm making this video because I can't leave the house. But it's fine. Everything's fine. I am fine and definitely not quarantine depressed. Could a quarantine depressed person do this? Anyway, there is a component of MVP like Nintendo I didn't touch on in my talk, but I think is really fascinating. And it is the part where the Game & Watch shaped Nintendo's entire handheld gaming product vision for uh, over 30 years now. I'm the kind of person who wins best by example, and Nintendo is a pretty fantastic example of what it, man, I just said example. I'm the kind of person who learns best by example, and Nintendo is great at what it looks like from the outside perspective to follow a product vision. In this video, we'll talk about what product vision means, some examples of how Nintendo specifically has utilized their product vision through the years, and some tips on how you can use product vision as the North Star in your own life, even your love life. Back on my bullshit. What the heck and gosh is product vision? Product vision as a concept in of itself can be complex, but for the sake of not starting fights with strangers on the internet, I'm going to keep it high level. Product vision is often described as the North Star for your product, meaning that it's the direction you want your product to go. In the days of old, Long before Google Maps and its extremely elegant ancestor, MapQuest, people used the North Star to try to figure out where the hell they were and um, where the hell they were trying to go. Product vision is a similar concept. They exist so that at any point during your product development, you can look at your vision and assess that you are still indeed going in the direction that you want your product to go and that you have not gotten distracted by some shiny feature that has really nothing to do with your product and just ran in that direction. During this video, we'll see some examples of how Nintendo is really good at sticking to that product vision. And although I jest with Mr. Jobs, and after shipping a few mobile apps, I admittedly have hostile feelings towards the iOS store. The truth is, if you want another really great example of how a company's dang good with product vision, Apple is it. That man knew how to make an airtight product vision. Most product visions are a couple sentences that are very clear what the product is or who it's for and how it's different from your competitors. This is an example layout of what it could look like. Now, this actually comes from Jeffrey Moore and his book Crossing the Chasm, but uh, I was introduced to it from Jana Bastow, who is the CEO of ProdPad and all-around product genius. In my experience, unless you are a team of one, creating your product vision is truly a team effort. I say this because when you craft your product vision, it really isn't just writing a couple of sentences like you saw previously. A lot of it is actually making sure that your team is on the same page about a lot of stuff. What your product is for, who the people you're building it for is, and you'd be surprised how easy it is to not be on the same page with your team about those things. The other thing about product vision statements is that they are actually uh, really hard to write. They could take up to in my experience, a few days just to come up with a few sentences. Now, part of that is definitely linked back to the team is not on the same page and you have to get everyone on the same page. But the other part of that is there's something about squeezing as much information as possible into like two or three sentences that is just really difficult. Okay, so we talked about what product is. <laughs> we did not talk about that. We talked about what product vision is, why it's important, and how you could go about making one. Before we start talking about the star of the show, Nintendo, it's time to do my third favorite activity, 
setting expectations. Number one, this is a case study. A case study is a research method involving up close, in-depth, and detailed examination of a particular case. So everything I say in this video is derived from studying Nintendo's history, from reading articles, from searching archives. I even called their customer service once in one case that I'll probably do for another video. It was for a different thing, but still. Man, that was a great, their customer, their customer service is like really good. By the way, I will also be linking where I got all my information because that's the change I wanna see in this world. I feel like this should be obvious, but I've worked with humans long enough to know better. I don't represent Nintendo. And with that out of the way, let's talk about the Game & Watch. World's most adorable astrophysicist, Carl Sagan, once said, if you wish to theorize Nintendo's product vision, you must first learn about the Game & Watch. I used Comic Sans on purpose. I'm mad about it. Some folks out there don't know anything about the Game & Watch, which is understandable because it came out 30 years ago and many of us can't even remember what we wore yesterday, let alone what happened 30 years ago. The other part of that is that the Game Boy was such a bonkers runaway success, which I'll touch on more in a minute. It just kind of overshadowed everything. I call the Game & Watch Nintendo's minimum viable product or MVP is what I'll be calling it from now on. I am not going to dive into what an MVP is because I already did that for 22 minutes at GDC. And if you want to learn about that, I'll link the video. You can knock yourself out. But I will give you the elevator pitch of what an MVP is. A minimum viable product is the small solution you can build that will bring the most value to your customers. You build an MVP after understanding who your users are and what their problems are. After building one, you gather feedback from your users and you iterate. Nintendo's MVP, or the Game & Watch, started with a super bored businessman on a train. The idea for Nintendo's first handheld came to be when Gunpei Yukoi, whom I lovingly refer to as Papa Nintendo, watched a businessman on a train dink around on his calculator in a desperate attempt to stave off boredom. As the businessman slowly died inside, an idea came to Mr. Yukoi. What if he could create a device to help with long commutes such as this? This also happens to be the beginning of what would become a strong vision for Nintendo's handheld gaming path. The problem they chose being boredom, their customer base, which is everybody, every, everyone gets bored, and the solution, eliminate boredom, that can strike anytime, any place. Side note, Nintendo posted a series of interviews titled Iwata Asks, in which the dearly departed Mr. Satoru Iwata interviews the development teams of various Nintendo titles and such. They're all very interesting to read. One series is with the original Game & Watch team, which is incredibly fascinating and where I pulled much of my research from. Unfortunately, our dear Papa Nintendo Gunpei Yokoi is not a part of these interviews because he was tragically killed in 1997, which absolutely sucks for a multitude of reasons. I think he would be so friggin' pumped to see where the handheld family went. Okay, anyway, and thus the Game & Watch is born. The result is a handheld using a calculator chip processor, by the way, which is so cool. Housing one game and a clock in the corner, hence the Game & Watch. Admittedly for years, I thought it meant a game and then you watch the game being played, but the clock makes a, a lot more sense than my stupid idea. The first game was called Ball, where you play a shuffling character named Mr. Game & Watch's menu of main scene in Super Smash Bros. who is juggling balls, trying not to drop any. In an interview with the original Game & Watch team, they discuss one of the earliest development decisions, which makes a very interesting hint if you're looking for traces of the vision Mr. Yokoi was trying to establish. It was important throughout the entire Game & Watch series that when a player messed up, they'd realize the game wasn't being fair. They would think, I'll try again. If a ball fell and the player was certain that he or she had caught it, but the game said otherwise, it would be frustrating. We decided to make it so that in situations where the players were likely to think they had caught it, the game would also recognize it as such. They hadn't caught it and according to the signal, but we would make the game's judgment a little loose. Were I a gambling sort of gal, and I'm not because I'm too easily distracted by flashing lights and loud noises and basically a magpie with opposable thumbs, I'd place all the chips I had that this decision was rooted firmly in vision. That vision being that the Game & Watch was going to be the ultimate boredom elimination machine, which you can't do if the machine frustrates you and makes you want to throw it against a wall. I also find this very interesting because it's one of the uh, earliest mentions I've seen of player forgiveness mechanics, something the makers of Mega Man have never heard of. The other reason I say this is because at this point in time, we can't be entirely sure that they've done any user testing because I also can't find anyone uh, fessing up to doing user testing, leading me to believe this was firmly rooted in vision. Due to hardware restrictions, Nintendo could only make one game per Game & Watch, but that did not slow them down. In six years, they would go on to make 59 independent titles, some titles taking only one month to create. I even have one. I have Donkey Kong. My fiance got it for me. Isn't that cool? 
This is one of my favorite anecdotes ever because it includes user testing and feedback, which is something near and dear to my heart. When Ball launched in 1980, members of the team went to the store to help associates sell the console. Originally, this was because the store was short-staffed and they need help, but in the end, they would make a very interesting discovery that would impact the company's outlook for forever. Wrapping products properly is important, but it must also be great learning experience to see how customers choose to buy a product. I thought so too. I can remember to this day how a grandmother and her child came into the store and the child said, here, I want this is what I want. The grandchild wanted a game and watch system. Yeah, but she said, it's too expensive. A game and watch system cost 5,800 yen, which was expensive for a toy back then. Right, I realized as I stood there how important it was to make a product of corresponding value. You don't learn that until you stand at a sales location, so it is important to experience the encounter of customers' reactions as the atmosphere in the shop. Mr. Iwata goes on to say that this sort of thing is a good experience for the next time around, and Kano agrees, saying it motivates him to do better. This experience was clearly impactful, as you can see that trend in Nintendo products to this day, when they release versions of their hardware that have fewer features, but are more affordable. As an aside, and I swear this is related, one of the biggest fights I ever got into with my first manager when I was a product manager was why Nintendo took so long to put a backlight into their handheld. My argument was firmly rooted in vision, that they couldn't make a device that would be at the price point they thought was fair without sacrificing playtime, so they waited until they could achieve both. My boss said it was strictly in manufacturing costs and nothing else. Now I think it was a mixture of the two, but they couldn't have made that call without having established a vision. So therefore I'm right. If my old manager is right, I'm gonna owe him like 200 bucks or something, so. The impact of the store light bulb moment shows when the Game Boy was launched in 1989. The team observed and listened carefully to the things the customers loved about the Game & Watch, such as the gaming portability and the battery life, and iterated on the things they didn't, such as introducing many games for one console all while finding a way to manufacture a product that kept to corresponding value. I will do another video on this, but the Game Boy was a bonkers runaway success. And I don't think people understand just how big of a success it was. It was the highest selling handheld console until 2010 when it was unseated by the Nintendo DS. 2010. And remember, it came out in 1989. Now, some of the data there is kind of wonky because those numbers actually include all of the Game Boys, like the Pocket, the Color, and the original. That's still nuts. It upsets me that people don't realize how nuts that is. Okay, back to iteration. This is one of my favorite pictures ever, and to this day I have no idea who made it and I can't find the original artist and I'm sorry. I like to use this diagram as an example of what iteration can look like after you've made your MVP. As you look down the timeline of the Game & Watch, the Game Boy, the rest of the handheld family, you can see hints of Nintendo's iteration, and on occasion, revisitation with each succeeding product. When I say revisitation, let's talk about that. For example, does this Donkey Kong Game & Watch look familiar to you? It totally does, because it's a DS, some 20 odd years before the DS was released. I didn't even know that Donkey Kong had a Game & Watch version. I didn't know that until I was researching it, and when I saw that I screamed because aside from the fact it's awesome, I would strongly argue it takes a team with a strong product vision to, uh, to, to do something like that. God, it's so cool. Let's talk about how your vision should show through marketing. A strong product vision doesn't, doesn't just show through the product itself, but it should bleed into other departments as well, which I'll touch on a little bit later, but especially marketing and how you market it to your users. And Nintendo's a really good example of this, especially with their handheld consoles. I'm gonna show you some ads and I want you to see if you can tell a theme. Here's the first ad. At last, a watch that's fun. Here's the second ad. A pie in the face of flight delays, long commutes, and endless campaign speeches. Third ad. Road trip advanced. And the last ad. This is the part where you go somewhere better. Did you notice a theme? They all sell their respective handhelds as the solution to boredom. This tends to be not so obvious in the more recent ad. During the DS, they had this strange touching is good campaign that like, you know, I like, are you serious about that? I just, but the point is no matter how many handhelds Nintendo has released, they are always looking to their vision of the ultimate boredom machine. It always goes back to that super bored man on a train. This is something that you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about your product vision. It should be your proverbial North Star to guide you. 
anyway, I'm going to start wrapping it up because this video is getting long and I have to edit it. So I would like to end on a serious note. Product vision is hard. It's very likely that watching this video would make one assume that vision is easy and uh, uh, not that difficult, but ask any product manager, any product designer, and anyone like that, they will most likely tell you, no, actually, um, creating and sticking to vision is like a uh, gangly, undeveloped muscle that um, you just have to slowly train over time. And that's, and that's totally true. It involves a lot of dedication from everyone on your team and from a lot of different departments. It also requires really, really, really good product leadership to talk about vision over and over in company standups, in meetings, in customer interviews, training, etc. In order for you to have a successful product vision, you don't nearly you don't need to necessarily be firing on all cylinders, especially if your company isn't gigantic. But the larger your team is, the more evangelizing you're just gonna have to do for your product vision. To this day, I can clearly remember the product vision of the first tech company I worked at because the product leadership was really good at evangelizing it at the time. Hey Jaffe, how's it going? And let's be real, evangelizing and communicating your own product vision could be its own hours long workshop in of itself. But thankfully, many other people have already done because I do not want to do that video. Here we are at the end of the video. No doubt, completely transformed individuals from when we first started. The Game & Watch is really only one facet of Nintendo, a corner of their history, if you will. But I really hope this video has shown you how impactful it was on their handheld gaming lineage. More importantly, I hope it helps you understand how you can utilize product vision to drive your own team, your own decisions, and your own product growth. If you find me amusing, I'm on the Twitter, where I undoubtedly will be talking about more of this. It's just inevitable, my friends. This is what I find interesting. These are my interests. I dumped all my skill points into being a giant nerd with high anxiety and bad eyesight. But please don't be mean to me, because I will cry. I'm not kidding. I cry at dog commercials, okay? Threshold's very low.